for anybody that I ran past before the service and didn't say hello. I had I made an error and I needed to get a, um, an outline out to the streamers before the service started. So if you're coming in and try to say hello and I didn't see you, it's because I didn't see you. Okay? <laughs> okay. I was highly focused on what I was going to do. Now the second item is I have this great pleasure of introducing a powerful woman of God. Probably most of you know her, Marja Saavedra. Okay? And I, I'm so impressed with this lady that it's hard to put it into words. To make healing school semester three, um, for example, her son was getting married and there was a, a shower for the bride to be, for the bride. And uh, she insisted that they change it because they scheduled it on a healing school day. Okay? That is putting God before your family. I believe because she did that, it came back to her in this testimony. I truly believe if she had not rescheduled that shower, if she said, Pastor, I can't come to healing school because it was her first time through. If she, I can't come to healing school because I have a, my son getting married. I think if she had done that, she would not be standing here today giving you a testimony she's about to give you. Okay? Um, so I let her say whatever she wants to say, um, and then I would add my own because she's very modest. <laughs> okay? Come on up, Margie. Just hold it right there? Okay. Okay, first of all, I want to thank everyone here that held my husband in prayer. Um, I really appreciate that. And um, I just want to go a little back farther. If you, I hope you don't mind, Pastor, but I need to say this because I should have said it three years ago, but I'm saying it today. I remember the first time I met Pastor Joshua. Um, he came to um, the rehab where my husband had been admitted for his first major liver challenge. And I remember when they walked in, I'd known Pastor Sarah before for a long time, so I greeted them, and then Pastor Joshua proceeded to my husband that had been seated on a chair because he couldn't balance himself because his whole right side was gone. Just his face was intact, but his whole right side wasn't working. And I had already, um, and it's funny because at the same time that that happened, I had been looking for another church. I had been going about four churches already so I knew a lot of people and I had asked people to come and pray for my husband for the healing and I stood there and I would hear everything and then I would wait and nothing would happen well this was a divine intervention because when Pastor Joshua walked in I greeted him I had never met him before and he asks my husband do you want your healing and I'm, like, I'm standing there and I'm saying wait a minute he knows he's gonna get healed I had never heard that before. And then he goes, and then do you want to keep your healing? And of course, my husband said yes. And I go, wow, I'm going to listen closer because this is something I've never heard before. And I had had other people come and pray. And then all of a sudden, Pastor Joshua and Pastor Sarah were praying. And I was looking at my husband while they were praying, not at the pastors. And all of a sudden, as they were praying, this cloud lifted up off my husband this big and it just came out of him and it floated away and evaporated in the air and when I looked back from the cloud to my husband he was just radiant full of the glory of God and when I saw that I said oh man this man of God knows something he's tapped into something wonderful beautiful and that's when I decided that I was going to start coming here at AABC church because I saw it with my very own eyes, the, the glory and the power of God. And then after that, the soon after that, two more major challenges happened. And the other one, Pastor... You might mention what happened to him physically after that. Well, after the rehab, um, he started... Well, Pastor gave us affirmations. So every day I would do the affirmations with my husband about that his right arm would begin to heal and his leg and... Just day after day, I could see the manifestation of the healing taking place. That the end, my husband walked out of that rehab on his own two feet. 
And people, our family were like in awe. And that was an opportunity for me to um, share that that's the power of our loving God, our loving Father. So then soon after that, I don't know how much time I have, but after that, um, he had another major one. And of course, I called Pastor Joshua right away. And I said, Pastor Joshua, he's in the hospital again. And so he, they came down and they, they ministered to my husband this time. And they prayed for him. He had been like in a semi-coma for a while. And then they came and ministered. When he woke up out of it, he, um, he woke up out of it and they ministered and, and prayed the healing. And I was there just listening to everything. And of course, we continued with affirmations. I made sure that he did affirmations. Um, and also right there and then, they didn't know if he was going to make it out of there. Um, so then, then he came home, and again, he, we gave the glory to God to everyone. Now, by the way, these challenges he's had really have been his own doing. You know, um, not God, because God is faithful. He is faithful. So then this last one, um, again, it was his own doing. He felt good. He decided to stop some of his medication. And went to get a hernia operation, and that hernia operation triggered all kinds of things that happened one after the other. He ended up in the hospital in January, and he stayed in there for about a month. And during that time, he went in that night, he went into the, the ICU, and they, he was losing a lot of blood. And so they wanted to keep him to keep giving him a transfusion from the blood that he kept losing because they didn't know where he was losing it from. So they, they, um, they decided to put, put um, I guess, what do they call when they put the, the, inner, the inner tube in the ICU, um, the breathing. Yes, because what they needed to do is they needed to calm him down so that his body could continue to heal. Oh, but before that, what they did is they did a, he had also uh, ruptured his esophagus. So they had, before they induced that um, life support, they had to go in there and, and uh, sew up the esophagus. They put like bands. And then after that, they decided that his body was going through too much trauma, so they induced you know, a sleep or with life support. So every day I would do what I've been taught here to do. I would do the spiritual warfare for the family and I would whisper it in his ears because he, he wasn't awake. But I knew he could hear me. I knew that his inner man, his spirit could hear me. So I would do that every day. And then what I started noticing that when I would walk into the ICU unit, all these nurses would say, I don't think he's going to make it. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if he's going to make it out of here. And of course, I knew who that was. It was coming against my faith. So then, what I and then what happened is they they tackled down the esophagus, and then the next day when I would come, it was something else. Then it was his platelets were low, and his hemoglobins were low, and so they had to do that. So here I would go again, and then what I started doing is establishing the kingdom of God in the room. So the nurses quit. But then the doctors started coming at me. <laughs> then the kidney doctor came and said, well, you know, we're going to have to uh, give him uh, kidney dialysis because his kidneys are shutting down. And so, of course, I called Pastor Joshua, and we started getting into prayer again and prayer again. And, um, and I w when the doctors were talking to me about, you know, if he wasn't going to make it, I was just looking at him. But in my head, I was saying, you're a liar, Satan. You're a liar, you know, so, and I would just bind the spirits and, and all that, and then, so they would tackle that one down, and then the next day, it was something else, so that's when I called Pastor Joshua, I said, Pastor Joshua, I don't know what's going on, it's like one thing after another, and Pastor Joshua just so calmly said, Marty, you're in spiritual warfare, and I go, wow, I have never experienced it like this before, you know, I've prayed for someone, a loved one, but nothing like this. So then that scripture came to me that said that he comes in like a flood, mm -hmm. but that then God will put up a standard. So I started affirming that one, <laughs> affirming it and affirming it over him and speaking over him. So what happened is everything stopped. And I would speak in his ear, you know, you're going to get out of here. 
you're going to be, by this weekend you'll be out of here. By this weekend you'll be out of here. And not actually that weekend, but that Sunday, it was almost over. The weekend was almost over. He got out of the ICU. Yes. And then he went into, uh, I think, five more days where they kept draining the fluid. His fluid builds up. So they have to keep taking it. And he was getting weak. He was getting weak because he just couldn't take it anymore. And he kept saying, well, you know, you know what to do. You know where to get out the papers. Ready? I said, no, honey, I don't want to hear that. Don't talk like that. Don't talk like that. Let's keep affirming. Let's keep affirming. And I wouldn't, and Satan would put it in my mind. Well, you better go see about the life insurance. Well, you better start doing this. And I said, no, if I do that, then I'm giving him the right to take my husband. So I didn't do it. And people would tell me that too. My love, my families would tell me, do you know if he's got life insurance? Do you, have you made, no, 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 I don't need to. Because I'm believing for another miracle. And amen, he dropped me off this morning. He's driving. <laughs> he, can't, he can't drive on the freeway yet, but he's driving. He's just a miracle of God. And God is so loving and so gracious. And I just thank Pastor Joshua and all the pastors here and, the, and Pastor Sarah that I've learned so much because we don't know when we're going to need it. We don't know when, when it, but we've got to be ready. And I thank you so much for all that I've learned from all of you and that I was able to put it into practice. Thank you very much. I love you all. No, Margie, before this last challenge, when he went into the hospital, was he driving before? Yes. He was driving? Okay. Well, praise God. So he's back the way he was. Yes. Praise God. Yeah, now, um, now uh, sh she just hit the highlights. He had ch challenges with seven major areas of his body. Okay, she didn't mention uh, his heart, nor his brain, nor his stomach. Okay, and the seven doesn't include the platelets and the hemoglobin. Okay, and she prayed him through every single step. He's alive today because he married a woman of God. I, I don't have the slightest doubt about it. Yeah, praise God. Thank you very much. Uh, Karen, pa Pastor Karen, come up here and pray that for us. What's his name again? Ar Armando. Armando, right? Okay. So we just, uh, in the name of Jesus, we pray that Armando will not just only drop Margie off to go to ABC, but that God opens the eyes of his understanding and flood it with light and softens uh, any hardness in his heart and gives him a hunger and a thirst after righteousness sake, like the deer pants after the water, that he will run to want to come to ABC Church and be a part of growing in God and learn the faith that God has shown his wife so that he, I declare, is now the high priest of his home. By faith we declare and call those things that are not as though they were and he will lead them with victory in the end times in Jesus' name and he will give his testimony to everyone that he knows and bring them to know uh, Jesus as Lord and Savior and healer and our provider in Jesus' name. And everyone that agrees says, Amen. Amen. He is the Savior of our souls. He is the Savior of everything that we are and everything that we have. But to receive the manifestation in our lives of the blessing for which he has already paid the price, we need to partner with God. <coughs> and to partner with God, it is impossible to do that without faith. And so we are doing this impromptu series on faith called The Essence of Faith. Part one was done by my, by my wife, and that triggered in me a number of things 
uh, and since I'm much more verbose than my wife <laughs> when it comes to preaching and teaching, <laughs> I'm, I'm taking three parts to do it. So this is part three, and we'll do part four the Sunday after Resurrection Day, part four. So in part two and three, last Sunday and this Sunday, we're using the same outline. And it's called Harnessing the Power of the Mind. If you're a graduate of the healing school or the Bible college, you know about the cycle of change. That the process of us changing into anything involves three parts of our being, our mind, our heart, and our tongue. And these three parts control what happens to our soul and our life. Now, in the overall, shall we say, strategic process of changing, of metamorphosizing, bringing out from this ugly worm, if you will, the glory of God's temple and the glory of God, through that metamorphosis, we have to look at the five parts of our being how the metamorphosis changes out of all five parts. But when we look at a more everyday or tactical approach to metamorphosis, what we focus on is the spiritual power of affirmation and the natural power of taking authority so that our minds control our bodies. There's a lot of power in the human mind. We talked about some examples. Power of walking on uh, hot coals. Power of going, you know, incredible long time without food. The power where people can actually die just because they believe the conditions around them are going to kill them. The mind is very, very powerful. We all know that. But the key in looking at the mind is understanding that the mind works like a computer. The mind doesn't care where the input is coming from. The input comes into the mind from five senses. That's a natural source. But it can come into the mind from fiery darts of the enemy. It can come to our mind from our heart. In different ways, it can come. God can speak to our minds. There's a multitude of ways that input comes to the mind. Most are natural, but some of them are supernatural. However it gets there, like the computer, it doesn't care where it's coming from. Once it hits the mind, that's reality. That reality will be processed by the mind. Just as a computer processes the input using whatever its history is, whatever its database is, it processes it, uses whatever is available to it, and puts out an output. And it thinks it's reality. So you might be watching television, or a good example, I guess, would be a 3D movie. You're watching a 3D movie, and this this uh, huge bird swoops towards you and you jerk your head away. <laughs> Is that true? The power of the mind. Some people last week were said when I gave them the example of biting into a lemon, didn't bother them. They didn't bother, didn't react. Some, some people do, not many. Uh, let's try this one. 
the number one fear in this country is public speaking. Now, those of you who uh, don't like public speaking, A, and B, we're not affected by the lemon. What if I call on you right now to come up here and speak? What happens to your stomach? Whoa! You feel something there in your stomach? Okay, that's the mind affecting your body. And you say, oh, well, that didn't bother me. Oh, you're a tough cookie. Okay, the number one fear in Great Britain is fear of spiders. Spiders. Now, I want you to close your eyes. If you're still, don't believe me, close your eyes and picture little itty bitty spiders crawling over your body. Woo! Did I, get, did I get you with that one? The power of the mind. No. One person is still shaking her head. But I know she, I know she understands and believes it, okay? Okay. Um, so, the mind is very powerful. And one of the big challenges we have in the world today is kids grew up on video. And it's not even so much TV anymore. They grew up on videos and video games. And that's like a reality. And the mind thinks it's a reality. And the mind starts to think, oh, if I shoot this person, it's no big deal. We can always reset the game and start over. But in real life, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't reset. You guys following me? Because yeah. this is really, really, really important. Okay. okay. So, I quoted last time a famous philosopher, famous philosopher who said, Kajito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. A lot of truth in it. It's not, it is not Christian. It is not really accurate, but it is very powerful. What you think can become your reality. Talk to any of the positive thinkers. Because a positive thinker will end up being a positive speaker. And a positive speaker will have positive things. For as you speak and not doubt, that's what you're going to have. So when you start thinking positive, what happens? As you think positive, the mind thinks it's a reality, starts to put it away as knowledge, and the heart takes the knowledge in the heart. And if, it's in, if it goes from the mind into the heart, as the cycle of change teaches, then when you speak it out your mouth, then there's power in it. It comes to pass. So positive thinking can impact what's stored in your heart. And what you start to believe in your heart that you speak will become reality. That's the power of speaking God's word. That's the power of affirm affirmation. But that's the power of speaking anything that you don't doubt in your heart. That's what the Bible says. If you don't doubt in your heart, when you say it, it shall come to pass. Amen? Okay, that's what it says. So, as the devil bombards our minds with these thoughts, and we dwell on them, they get deposited in our hearts because the act of meditation is an action. If you act on what's in your mind, it is deposited in your heart. Cycle of change. That's how strongholds get built up in your heart. Because when we're small, when we're small and not so smart, we're taught so many things by people that were wrong. They were well-intentioned. They may have been pastors. They may have been parents. They may have been relatives, teachers, and structures. They teach a lot of stuff that contradicts the Word of God. If it contradicts the Word of God, it's wrong. And we build up these strongholds. And that's known as iniquity. And if you have iniquity in your heart, God can't hear your prayers. So now we start today in part C. Aligning the mind. We want a mind that's renewed, focused on God, and aligned with the Bible and with godly things. How do we align the mind? Well, the number one thing, starting point, is to understand that the mind is involved in spiritual warfare. In fact, the mind is the main battleground. The mind is the main battleground. So the devil attacks the mind 
primarily the mind with fiery dots. The devil is not really interested in controlling your mind per se, but he certainly is interested in controlling your tongue. And if he can control your mind, he can control your tongue, and your tongue guides your life. <coughs> Plus, if he can get you to meditate in your mind on anything, that something will eventually be deposited in your heart. So the mind is the access point for controlling your tongue, and the mind is the access point for your heart. In any warfare, the armies, the military, the sides go after the highest point. Nowadays, it's not like World War I or World War II where they're trying to capture a little hill or a farmhouse in the middle of that land. You don't see that anymore. Nowadays, they're going after the high ground, that which controls everything. Computers, internet, and satellites. Satellites are literally the high ground, computer-based. That's where the warfare is today. When uh, North Korea attacked Sony for releasing the movie that was a spoof about their president, the United States retaliated. They didn't say we retaliated. No. But they knocked out the power in, in uh, the capital which I can't pronounce. Okay? Now, having said that, it's a good thing I don't have a movie coming out, otherwise I'd go after my movie. Okay? So, it's warfare. It's computer warfare. So, there are two kinds of reality to the mind, and anybody who studies psychology knows this. There is the natural or physical reality, and then there's a the perceptual reality. No, it's a bit more complex than that. But what the devil is trying to do is create in you and me a perceptual reality which matches what he wants us to think and do. We need to differentiate between reality, perceptual reality, and the reality of faith. And because most people don't know the Word of God, they have a difficult time doing that. So when we walk by sight, what does that mean? In this context, walking by sight means the mind is accepting from the five centers a variety of natural input. The input is coming in, and the mind is accepting that as reality. Why would it do that? Because when the input comes in, the mind doesn't care what it is, if it's right or wrong. Garbage in, garbage out. The mind doesn't care. Here comes some input. Oh, it's a fiery dart of the enemy. The mind doesn't care. Here's the input. I match it against my database, my memory, my experiences, my knowledge of the word. And if the person's knowledge of the word is very small in that area, it passes go. It accepted as reality. And as it's accepted as reality and meditated upon or acted upon or spoken, it gets deposited in their heart and that perceptual reality becomes a spiritual and a natural reality. Now, when the doctors and the nurses kept telling Margie, your husband isn't going to make it, <laughs> I, I remember the last go-around. It uh, was a couple years ago, I guess. And I remember the doctor telling Margie, well, we've done it again. <laughs> we've pulled him back from death. We've done it again. <laughs> well, okay. It was time before last, okay? Let me tell you, that is the powerful woman of God, okay? Okay? Powerful woman of God. But she never accepted all the negative reports from the doctors and from the nurses. So when we walk by sight, we accept as reality that which is coming through the five centers or from the fiery dots. So the mind accepts them, processes them as, re as reality, and then starts to direct the body to make them come into being. So when the doctor says, here's the result of my diagnosis, why don't I step in a, more, a few more tools while, I, while I'm at it? You know, Here at ABC, we use a psychological model called DISC. 
dominant, influencing, steady, and compliant. Okay? Which we've been talking about teaching again for a few years, okay? We haven't done it for quite a while. The staff has. Now, the com compliant type are the ones who are very detailed and analytical, like scientists, like doctors, like lawyers, like accountants, like bookkeepers, like computer programmers, high seas. So when they look at a problem, they're looking for problems. You're going to buy a new system. What about kind of system you can buy? A new refrigerator. And they will study it for you and tell you, here's all the things that can go wrong with it. Here's all the things where it's weak in this area and weak in this area. All these things can break down. Here's how long you expect it to last. What do we call all, this, all the things? We call them curses. So people who are high C have to really guard themselves against speaking curses over themselves and their possessions. The doctor was a high C in the natural and scientifically explaining to Margie about her husband all the challenges he was seeing based on his years in medical school. How many years is that? Well, it's four years of college and four years of medical school, maybe about two years more of internship. Let's call it ten years. How many years have I been studying the Bible? A lot longer than ten years, I can tell you that. Second Corinthians 10, verse 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. He's talking about warfare and the weapons of our, of our warfare. They're not carnal. Our weapons are not carnal, but they're mighty for pulling down the strongholds. In fact, the verse before says, we, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We do not war after the flesh. Our weapons are not carnal. Verse 5. But cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalt itself against the knowledge of God. Cast it down from where? Primarily from your mind. What's your mind? Your mind is whatever it your mind is, which they have trouble defining what a mind is. It is a reflection of the brain. No brain, no mind. Okay? That's kind of carnal. We know that we can affect the mind and memory by sticking instruments in different parts of the brain. So though we're warring in the spiritual realm, we're casting on imaginations from the mind, from the brain. Cast on imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. High thing. The high thing that here doesn't mean it's big. The high means it's lifted up in a high place as an act of worship. You understand me? Do you know when, probably in every single city and town in this country, I don't know, don't know that to be a fact, but in general, Satanists go into a city and they pick the five highest points around the city and they establish satanic halters. Those are high places. They are places of satanic worship. They're all over. The Bible talks about the high places of worship and you cast them down in the Old Testament. Here, the high place of worship is in the mind. Every thought that comes into your mind that contradicts the word of God is an act of disobedience to God an act of worshiping the enemy. It's a high thing. It's, a, it's an altar. And when you let that altar sit in your mind, and you meditate on the altar, and you keep bringing offerings to the altar, thinking about it, that altar will affect your body and build up strongholds in your heart, which will guide your tongue and your life. Got quiet. I know why I got quiet. Because I used to be at the place where some of you still are. Where my mind was a battleground. Was being bombarded by a fire dust. Fire dust to sin. Fire dust to do things that I wouldn't have called sin. But God would have. You know, give somebody a piece of my mind. Fire dust of a bunch of committee talking in my head. 
right? And there's an argument going on back and forth, and I'm kind of sitting back listening. Who are all these guys? And then what I call the woulda, shoulda, coulda demons all coming up. I wish I had done that. I should have done that. I could have done this. There's even a thing on TV. I skit about woulda, shoulda, coulda, right? The woulda, shoulda, coulda demons. All in your mind. All coming to that altar, that high thing, whatever it is. High place of offense, high place of unforgiveness, high place of sexual sin, high place of, of uh, whatever it is. It's coming there. And we partake of it by bringing the offerings of our time and our body. How about a sexual fantasy? I'm sure nobody here except maybe me has had one. But a sexual thought comes to your mind. And what? Maybe you like it. And you start thinking about it. Can that affect your body? Is an example of the mind affecting the body. And what we're doing is bringing offerings to that altar of sexual sin. And it's never satisfied. No sin in the mind is ever satisfied. It keeps coming back for more and more. But you can come to a place where they're all cast down. Where your mind is peaceful. Where the woulda, shoulda, coulda don't come. The committee is gone. And you walk around and your mind is peaceful. How do I know it's possible? Because that's where I'm at. I'm not saying I don't have a challenge with my mind once in a while. What's the rarity? How often? I don't know. Maybe once a week. Maybe less. Maybe a bit more. All the things that used to challenge me don't challenge me anymore. You can get there. And that's what we're teaching in our various schools is how to do that. How to come to that place of spiritual warfare. You know, one of the greatest men of God in modern times is Apostle Kenneth E. Hagan. <coughs> Apostle of faith. But you can have only, only have faith for what you know. And within what he knew, he was just probably the best. But his knowledge goes back, what, well, 60 to 100 years ago. God hasn't been standing still. Can you imagine if somebody who could drive a car 60 years ago comes to you in your new 2016 car and says, I want to race you because I've been driving for 60 years? You would laugh. Wouldn't you laugh? What's the difference? Somebody's coming to you and making theology based on God's revelation on the earth from 60 to 100 years ago. Is it still true? Absolutely. Does the old Model T Ford run? You can still see them around us. They run. But they ain't going to compete with some of these cars that can go zero, 0 to 60 in what? Three seconds? Technology marches on. It doesn't march on as fast as God marches on. The only thing that's slowing God from marching on is you and me. And I'm through slowing him down. You know, people say, man who loves me, tells, told me the other day, a couple of times, he said, you know, if I didn't know the Bible, I think you're totally crazy. <laughs> no, he was, he was concerned about me saying things that people are going to think I'm crazy. Then after a while he said, you know what, you probably don't care who think you're crazy. You're right. I don't care who, I don't care who think I'm crazy. No, the man loves me. And he's learning a lot. But you know who I want to please? God. Jesus. The Holy Spirit. Everything else is some kind of altar. An altar of not offending people. An altar of peer pressure. An altar of being like other pastors. I... Let's not go to the eye. Let's pull that altar of pride, okay? So, we cast on imagination and every high thing that exalt itself against the knowledge of God. Tear down the altar is what it's saying. And bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You can only know, do that if you know the word of God. How can you bring it into the obedience of the word if you don't know what it is? But listen now. We're talking about Kenneth Hagin, okay? 
he made a statement which is a wonderful statement that I have quoted much of my Christian life until maybe the last five years. He said, you cannot prevent birds flying over your head, but you can prevent them making a nest in your hair. In other words, you can't prevent a, a thought coming to your mind, a sinful thought coming to your mind, but you can prevent them building an altar in your mind. He didn't say that. So you can prevent them taking up root in your mind. Hey, sounds wonderfully good. You can't prevent birds flying over your head, but you can prevent them making a nest in your ear. It's a wonderful truth, and it's very helpful, but there's a level above it. We are supposed to be standing on the shoulders of giants. And Kenneth E. Hagan was a giant of the faith. We want to stand on his shoulders, not sit at his feet. We sit only at the feet of Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you, I got some friends who are hunters. One's here today. I don't know if he hunts birds, but he hunts things. But I got people who hunt birds. Let me tell you something. I never yet see one of them go duck hunting and have a duck sit in their head. <laughs> never. In fact, the ducks when you fly over their heads. As soon as they fire the first shot, every duck is gone. No. You think that demons, devils, and evil spirits are not as smart as a duck? As a duck? As a duck? No. They're smarter than ducks. If the duck takes off when you shoot the first duck, why do you think these guys are going to hang around so you can shoot them? You say, how do you shoot the demon, devil, and evil spirit? By taking the word of God, you can do anything through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. You take a sword and you shoot him. Right? But how you do that, we teach you more and more in graduate school. Much of that is in semester five. So if you think, somebody came to me once, a long time ago and said, you got here in school, why do you want Bible college? Why would you create a Bible college when you got here in school? Well, you can only ask that question if you haven't been through them. You know, somebody said, you got healing school and you're going to replace it with School of Dominion? We're not replacing it. Healing school is on the internet and more people are going to go through the healing school on the internet than ever went through here in person. But School of Dominion is moving up to where we can stand on the shoulders of giants and we can go demon hunting. And your mind can be free. Because your mind can only be free and peaceful if you understand spiritual warfare and Know that when a dumb, when a, what do you call this, guys? Bully. A dummy bully, okay. When a dummy or a bully hits you, you hit him back harder. It's that simple. When you know how to hit back the demons harder, they don't bother you. Really. They'll come in, you know, for a kamikaze shot, boom, and try to run away. Usually they don't make it. See, when you, people think about the book of Revelation, they think, look at all these terrible things happening. Surely God isn't going to let us go through that. What are you going to do? Run away and turn the world over to the earth? No, we're going to run away and Jesus is going to take care of it. Really? I thought the Bible says he's going to be seated at the right hand of the Father until his enemy has been put down. Woo! It's only one point. Stick around. This year we're going to talk about all the reasons why the pre-tribulation rapture is a myth. Okay? Not only a myth. It's ex thank you for the right word. Here's a man who's really a pastor. Dangerous. That wasn't the word I was going to use. <laughs> it's extremely dangerous. As they say in Francais, dangereux. Ah! For the uninitiated, that's tongues. <laughs> okay so since verse 5 was so good let's go on to verse 6 and having in this is the King James and having in a readiness having in a readiness that means get ready having in a readiness to revenge you all know what revenge means we keep having to cast it down right to revenge all disobedience you all know what disobedience is so it says, be ready to revenge all disobedience. When your obedience is fulfilled. What does that mean? It's wonderful. 
Very wonderful. Demons sneak in and they hit you with a thought in the head. And it grabs you at a weak moment and you do it. You know it's sinful? Or maybe you don't even know it, but you find out afterwards. You do it and you do this thing. And then you finish doing it and you realize, you know, that was the devil. I just sinned. I'm so sorry. You are where I be. And you renounce the devil, the demons, and you break their hold. All right? Here's where you revenge the disobedience. They're the disobedience. Satan is the disobedience. You bind up the demons that put the thought in your head. And you get rid of them. That's the casting or part that we teach. That's the first step towards revenging or disobedience. If you want to learn more, get into graduate school. That part is taught in Union School Semester 3 and School of Dominion 3. And a little bit of it in 2. So having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So, back to the old time. That's why we cast on all imagination. We don't want it building up strongholds in our heart and affecting our bodies. Everybody, and if you walk away from this today, know that you know that the high things built up in your mind affect your body and you and your body <laughs> are now being put on the altar of the high thing. Crawl off the altar. Crawl off the altar, okay? Glue him to the altar. Glue yourself, uh, glue yourself to the altar of God, not to the, <laughs> okay? Amen. Not to the demonic altar. Crawl off of that altar and get back in worshiping God. Because what we offer to God is a living sacrifice. Our bodies are the living sacrifice. Our body is a sacrifice on the altar we give to God. Obedience. Disobedience wants to put you on the altar of the high thing. Cast it down. Get off the altar and go back to God. To prevent this casting down of the evil input, the devil tries to occupy your mind with fear. He tries to keep you on the altar by gluing you to the altar of the high thing with fear. And when fear manifests and is strong enough, you're physically immobilized and you can't even move. The devil tries to occupy, occupy your mind with fear and all the various things, fantasies, all these evils. So you're trying to stand in faith for your healing and the devil started to tell you all the scenarios that can go wrong. Those are all high things raising up against the word of God which says you've been healed by the strap of Jesus. So faith and the mind. If you're not going to walk by sight, you must walk by faith. Walking by faith means you're making your decisions based on the word of God or the voice of God. So you're either making your decisions by faith, you're making your decisions based on the word of God or the voice of God, or you're making it by the altars you're building up in your mind. Faith is believing in your heart. But the believing in your heart must be based on knowledge in the mind. Here's what happens to some people. They read the Bible. They say, God supplies all my need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. In their heart, they know it's the word of God. So they start to affirm it. God supplies all my need. But they are affirming it not based on the fact that God supplies all they need. They are affirming based on the fact that the Bible is true. Which is a good starting point. In other words, it is in the Bible. And I, I believe the Bible is the word of God in my heart. So I affirm based on the Bible. But since God being your supplier has not yet got down in the heart. The stimulus is really coming from the mind. The mind is what believes it. So, once the mind loses that vision, loses that picture, loses that meditation, which it will eventually, by all the bombardments of the fiery darts, you know, a checking account with no money, big bills coming in, things breaking.
once the mind loses the vision that you've been, God provides your need, then there's no stimulus to the belief in your heart. And so, you say, sure, I believe God provides my need, but there's no power. The power that you had, the only power came from believing the Bible is the word of God. And that's gone because the stimulus, the vision is gone in your mind. That's called mindset, mental ascent. You mentally agree with it, and you're trying to get your mind to power it. But the mind cannot stand up by itself against all the fiery dots. You need to take the scripture and make it real in your heart by acting on it over a period of time and speaking it. Then it becomes real in your heart. And because it's real in your heart, it will support your mind when the fiery dots come. What we want to do is keep the image in our mind 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Person is going to walk again. You know, um, I'm trying to pick a name we haven't got here. Okay, Garfunkel is going to walk again. Okay, so Garfunkel is going to walk again, and you picture it. And that's what Garfunkel should be doing. I've been healed by the strap of Jesus. I'm going to walk. I see myself walking. I tell my mind I'm walking. My mind tells my heart I'm walking. I declare it. I speak it. I fill my mind with everything that says I'm going to walk which is God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Word of God, and all the things we do. The ten steps we have for spiritual warfare. You flood yourself in your mind with it. So the image is always in your mind. But if you're running here and running there and doing this and doing that, and you don't spend much time in the Bible and with God, the image disappears from the mind. And you don't see it very well, very clearly anymore. Like the book of James says, it's the, it's the mirror. You see it, and then you're gone. You don't see it anymore. You want that mirror on all the time. You want the Word of God in your mind all the time, so it comes down. And then, then, your mind starts to tell your body, you know, you can walk. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I'm going to close with one story and make this five parts. We're going to, we're going to grow like Popsy. I don't know who Popsy is, but it sounds good. Okay. Uh, when I was in college, I didn't like John Wayne. When I was in college, I didn't like Ronald Reagan. When I was in college, Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, I said the only thing wrong with my diploma from the college I went to was that it was signed by Ronald Reagan. I used to say that before I got born again. But eventually I got to like John Wayne and Ronald Reagan. And John Wayne made a movie called The Wings of Eagles. It's about the first American pilot, the man who helped found the Air Force. Great pilot. And uh, after a while, he had an accident, was paralyzed. And he had a, a second man, somebody who was in the military under him, I don't, I don't know what his title was. And this guy kept telling him, you're going to walk again. And so he got him, he couldn't move his legs, he couldn't move anything. All the way down, nothing would move. This is a true story. And so the guy had him on a, uh, like a massage bed, where he could stick his head to the hole, and see his toes. And he would say, Toes move. Toes move. He lie there for hours saying, Toes move. Toes, I command you to move. Toes move. He did affirmation in his toe, on his toes without the name of Jesus for months, telling his toes to move. This is all in the movie. Toes move. Toes move. Toes move. And one day after a long, long time, a toe moved. And then another toe. And the, all the toes. And then the feet and the ankle, and eventually got to the point where he could walk with, uh, with support. From seeing it in his mind. He got the vision from the man who worked for him. He saw it in his mind, and he kept saying it, he kept saying it, he kept saying it, kept saying it. He kept the vision in his mind. We want to keep godly visions in our mind. You don't want to keep devilish visions in your mind. 
That's why so many people lose. They have the vision in their mind of fear. When I started, the devil would bombard me with thoughts. If you don't go see the doctor, cancer is going to grow in your body. I think over the last 30 years, his brother told me I've got cancer in eight different places. Okay? One time I'm watching television, 10, 15 years ago, maybe longer, and it came on where if you got any, got four or five of these seven symptoms, you've got X, Y, Z. <laughs> oh boy, I had all, I had in the natural all of them. So what did I do? Only one smart thing you can do. Turn the television off. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to end here, okay? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. No, picture this as a good sermon. Even if you have to imagine it, and give the Lord a big round of applause. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.